Well, national liberation movements that continue to rule in Southern Africa, where there is a growing dissatisfaction by many of the citizens. All of the key players during the national liberation era were men on the left who shared a commitment to an anti-imperialism and pan-Africanism. Could, could these movements rather be replaced by parties on the right, though? To discuss the fate and the trajectory of national liberation movements, we are joined by Africa analyst, advocate Sipo Mandula. Advocate, a very good morning to you, and thank you so much for joining us on our program today. Refreshing morning, my sister, and Jumbo Africa to the viewers. A very important month in the continent. Uh, as we're in the new season, and just last month, we just came from the SADC month, and I think this topic very relevant, and even, uh, one can say, relevant in the sense that when you talk of fr uh, frontline states, we are talking of liberation movement since the 70s until now. Mm. Indeed, you're right in saying SADC, in fact, marked its 30-year milestone not so long ago. Uh, but talking about SADC countries and liberation movements, we just came out of Angola's general elections and we saw the MPLA there secure a victory, even by a slim majority. Similar projections have been made with regards to the African National Congress here at home, likely to secure a win, but again, by a slim majority. Uh, just talk to us about what is happening to our national liberation movements, why are they suddenly uh, having to deal with this decline in electoral support? My sister, you know, even the viewers will know that uh, the decline have started, one can say, since the early 2000. Uh, we saw it from Zimbabwe, uh, we saw it from Namibia, we saw it from Zambia, we saw it even from, uh, one can say, neighboring countries that include even Angola as you have mentioned, but the issue is around legitimacy, it's around popular unrest that are the pressures of what are called socio-economic challenges that are facing these SADC countries. But the issue of liberation movements, it is this concept of the, that they have liberated their countries. Now they think they are the only permanent solutions to the current challenges. And that's where the liberation movements, you will even recall, the ANC used to call itself a political movement. Only after the conference that they had in Cape Town, they started to move to the concept of being a liberation movement once more. So if you look even at the context of liberation movement in the SADC region, or broadly in the African continent, it is a challenge around that there is corruption within those liberation movements. There is a sense of uh, entitlement of saying that we are the leaders of today and tomorrow. And that's where you find that they have been overtaken by even events. Hence we saw in Zambia, Hakainde, the Chilema taking over. We saw what has happened now recently, as we have mentioned, even if it is still an electoral dispute stage in Luanda, it is, it is still early that MPLA has been given flames or has been shown flames by UNITA. As we have said as well, South Africa, we have seen the decline of liberation movement of the African National Congress and of the PAC and Azapo with the uh, coming of new political parties. So those issues, because they center around the issue of that, are they relevant? Are they responding to the socio-economic, cultural needs? of their citizens. Mm. Uh, advocate, talking about the issue of legitimacy, which you've raised, and, and, and relevancy, we know that here at home the catalyst for a lot of the dissatisfaction that we were talking about has been the rampant corruption that we've been seeing, the, the lack of service delivery, the neglect that the South African people has been exposed to over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I want to hear from you, though, why is this legitimacy resonating so much more amongst the youth. Uh, when we're talking about youth apathy, voter turnout has been an issue being raised at a lot of these general elections that, we, that we're remarking on this morning. The youth in particular are not inspired by any of these governments that are being ruled, being governed by these liberation movements. As you know, I'm in the academic space and as an intellectual soul rebel, I would always say you see the signs of voter apathy from even universities. When you see students not interested in politics, when you come to the ward level at the local government, when you find people not interested in ward committee meetings, 
And when I talk about, le- I mean, legitimacy, I was raising the same issue that you are raising in terms of elections, that they lost legitimacy once you have people who, who even doesn't go to vote or who go and spoil their ballot paper. But the thing that I wanted to raise again is that beyond the elections, it is the issue around even what are the issues during electioneering time that you are bringing to the youth. And the second aspect, I think it is too early for us to can condemn these young people of this African continent because the African continent, it is constituted by a youthful population. Mm-hmm. So the issue of voter civic education, very critical that we should do it consistently. It, it is not only to teach our electorate just to mark an X or to, or, or, or to can do a mark only during election time. It's the issue of accountability. Do our youth electorates hold the leaders accountable. The issue of the youth participation and representation in the leadership circles. Hence you find that the issue of intergenerational leadership has been raised in many African countries, but it is still lacking. You are still founding our elders or our aged uh, leaders who are still holding into power and we don't have young generation who are coming forth to lead. So maybe the youth electorates, they want to see their peers contesting for power. And once they don't see them, they see it as just a meaning, a meaningless exercise. But I will assume that there is a need for us to constantly engage the youth about how this freedom and democracy in the African continent has been fought and it has been uh, attained after so long. Because the issue, again, it is that legitimacy. But the issue that you raise again of, of corruption, they've become systematic endemic and that's where liberation movements have to cleanse themselves around this issue of being corrupt and mm-hmm. also delaying development because young people want to see change want to see development but at the same time they must understand the price of freedom and liberation mm, indeed the issue of empty promises is a very serious one nevertheless advocate for all our critique of liberation movements this morning they have endured I mean when we look at the MPLA it's you know clung to power for close to 50 years the African National Congress since the the dawn of this country's uh, democracy so they have an appeal even if it is one that is suffering decline on the flip side of that uh, we have opposition parties that have slowly but surely been gathering uh, their own form of electoral support. They have electoral bases all across uh, the countries that we're talking about today. However, they haven't managed to cross the, the Rubicon, so to speak. Why is that? Where are the opposition parties failing uh, as citizens of the African continent when it comes to real uh, democratic progress and transformation and the kind of you know, changes that citizens are looking for? Because I would want to say again, we should not be found in this interview to be lamenting or castigating liberation movements. They had a very clear mandate and objective to liberate their African citizens. But along the way, they lost that plot. But if you look about opposition, it is the same. You find in Africa, we have what I call coalition politics. Quali- I mean, the convenient coalitions of opposition parties that they end up losing their focus too. Because after elections, you, one will even use the case study of not only Zimbabwe, you'll see the case study of Lesotho as we are going for the Lesotho election soon. Then you'll see dynamics of coalitions. South Africa, we saw in the local government, we see coalition politics coming in. Now, when you talk about opposition, you don't have to be opposition for the sake of the word opposition. What are you or opposing when you cannot challenge the national development issues? And like we have said, the liberation movements had a noble goal, but some of them have went out. They've been absent in the national discourse of the country. Instead, they are having internal party political factions, and that's where they lose their focus. The same like opposition, they end up having a character assassination of one leader. If you look at Zimbabwe, they will critique the former president, the late president. They currently critique the current president, but they don't go into the policies of ZANU-PF. The same like when you look in MPLA and UNITA, there was that slight neck-to-neck, but in short, because I said to you, the opposition have to be relevant as well and have to understand the national discourse of their countries. Mm. And that's why I would say again, the politics of cheating in elections, 
The ruling liberation movements have mastered it, my sister. I don't want to lie to you. They master it with even foreign hackers in our electoral democracy project. They say once you are in power, you don't want to leave power. And that's a problem of our liberation movements, that they end up even used analogy of until Jesus come. And it seems Jesus is coming to most of the regions in the African continent. So the notion of who will rule until Jesus come, I think will fade away because they are still hacking elections. And we should be confronting them to say, don't cheat in the electoral process. Allow the citizens to elect their representatives. And the issue that we have been raising since this morning, corruption, it is endemic, it delays development. Mm. I mean, well, in, in closing, uh, advocate, I think just to refer back to the question that we posed at the start of this conversation, what comes next? You know, for a lot of these uh, countries on the African <coughs> continent, specifically in the Southern African region, a lot of these national liberation movements, what they stood for uh, in the fight against imperialism has become sort of, you know, threaded into the fabric of a lot of these societies and their identities. What comes after a liberation movement that has failed uh, to continue to secure that electoral support from its citizens? That, that shows that they have lost focus. Either they have lost their uh, signal to their uh, electorates, but uh, I would have said that the political liberation movements in Africa, they have got a new discourse, and that new discourse is informed by what the former president of Ghana would have said, Nkrumah, that the new stage that we are in is no longer colonialism, but it's neo-colonialism, which is the highest stage of imperialism. People talk about economic freedom, but I said since it's Heritage Month, what about cultural freedom? Are we free as Africans, our identity? Are we even representing our political ideals as Africans? So if one looks at the new struggle of liberation movement, is to still tap on what we were saying earlier, the youth interest, how do they start to entice the young people? The women in leadership, we have never spoken about women in leadership. Most of the liberation movements are still patriarchal. They must balance what I used to call patriarchy and matriarchy. There is this need of balancing. And the youth leadership, it is needed. So liberation movements also need to start to question their relevancy because you cannot be looking at the history only. We need to work around the present and the future. And this issue of saying we have liberated them, there will be no other liberation movement. I think it's far-fetched. They need to understand that their role is to attack the current challenges. The new imperialism stage that we are in, it includes that even our former colonizer is still having appetite in Africa. So liberation movements have to be relevant, have to gain legitimacy from, I mean, from the voters, have to gain popular support from the youth, and at the same time have to accept that there are new players in this electoral space. As we have said, we saw local government how it has shown flames to the ruling party right. in South Africa. Come 2024, we'll be seeing the same challenges. Mm. Asante Sana, my sister. Advocate, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, that is Advocate Sipo Mandula taking us through the electoral decline for a number of liberation movements on the continent.